Okay, it seems that I was able to organize things here. For some reason, uh, technology keeps tricking me every <laughs> Friday morning. So two minutes before the beginning of our class, everything was all right. And then suddenly OBS, that is the software that I use to record and broadcast this, uh, just crashed and I had to rearrange everything. Uh, but anyway, uh, the idea of uh, our class today is to revisit Dell's model. I apologize again, I, I, I tried a different setting here and I see that I'm sort of hiding from you uh, somehow uh, because I'm behind uh, my, my screen here. But this is so that we can, my idea is so that we can put this recording in uh, the Moodle um, platform afterwards and you have an additional source of material there. So we're revisiting uh, Adele's model some 20 years later. Uh, the paper that you read for today was, was an interview that uh, Michael Dell gave uh, to Harvard Business Review in 1998, right? So it's actually 21 years ago. Um, and of course, at that stage, uh, the Dell model was really the thing everyone was looking at Dell and trying to understand what they were doing and why they were doing it the way they were doing when everyone else was still working on their traditional ways of um, relating to customers and to suppliers. Right? One thing that we, we did in a previous class was to discuss the ways we could use information systems uh, to to better relate to customers. So the idea was that uh, we, we could use the, our technology to build a dialogue with customers and to understand from them directly what their needs are and therefore what their, um, I mean, what, what we should have built as value into our products. Okay. Uh, in our last class, which was a virtual class. Uh, I think I, I, I uh, the beer game. Yeah, the beer game. I don't even know. I was already here. The, oh, it's because we, we were doing it in the, in an evening, right? Uh, and I wasn't sure if everyone would, would be able to uh, to come here physically, so we did it virtually. I was uh, I didn't remember if I was in France or in Saudi Arabia. No, I was I, I was here in Curitiba. Um, uh, what we tried to do there was to simulate or, uh, or to emulate a supply chain in which each one of you performed uh, as one of the actors in that supply chain. So we had, uh, well, it, it is the beer game. It's a, a, this is a traditional game that has been around in business schools and in computer science schools, but in, in, in engineering schools. Everyone plays this game uh, to, to show how clumsy the relationship among different actors in a supply chain may be when the, the information flow uh, doesn't happen the, let's say, the, the best way. Uh, what we simulated there in, in, in our beer, beer game was the, an information flow that basically involved uh, customers making orders or asking their suppliers for the amount of uh, goods that they needed uh, to, let's say, to play optimally in the market, uh, at least from a very um, localized perspective. Each one only knew the orders they received from their customers, and then based on the orders they received from their customers, based on their the policy that they had inventory for, for, for keeping inventory, they decided how much, uh, or each one of you decided how much you asked, uh, you, you would order from your suppliers. Uh, we noticed at the end of uh, the game uh, that um, the, the results were really uh, weird. Not uh, unexpected from me, but maybe unexpected from your point of view. And basically what happened there, uh, and I included in the, in the material that we, we had uh, for extra class uh, reading, I'm sorry, just, let me just go here to... I included uh, a paper that was written by uh, Hao Li, a professor at Stanford in 1997. Let 
Let me make it visible to you here. Oh, yeah. Let's see if I can have uh, things here. I think this is it. Let me see what you're seeing there. Yes, yeah, this is this is uh, uh, the paper that Howley uh, and some colleagues uh, wrote: the bullwhip effect in supply chains. And in fact, the maybe the main effect that we noticed there when we were deciding our own orders based on the orders that we received from our customers, but also other, uh, other information that was relevant to us, specifically the, the level of our inventories, we start including noise in the system because we start uh, trying to predict what is going to happen in the future. Uh, and uh, we start to play and, how would I say, uh, in doing our forecasts, we try to optimize our own um, performance in the game, or let's say in the supply chain, and uh, and by doing that, we signal to others in a in a direction that may even be different to, to what is happening in the market. For example, the retailers uh, uh, would order their suppliers more than they had been ordered from the, the customers because they are already forecasting that in the next rounds they will need uh, more supplies. But when they do that, their suppliers also think that the market is sort of heating up uh, and they also increase the levels of production if they are already the manufacturers or of orders that they place to their own uh, suppliers uh, so that uh, they they, they, they can better adjust to their own um, forecasts, right? And uh, by doing that, uh, we get what uh, uh, Howley and, and, and even before him, even in fact, the first one to notice this was Mr. Forrester, a professor at uh, the MIT in the 50s, what they called the bullwhip effect. Bullwhip, because it's almost like, it's an analogy of having a whip in your hands and with a very little shake of your hands, the, the, the other side of the whip makes a huge movement. Right? So this is what we discussed uh, in, in our uh, previous virtual class. Uh, we, we got to, I, I mean, I, 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 I got to talk to you a little bit about some possibilities of reducing that, the problem of the bullwhip effect by better dealing with information. Of course, we are information systems people, so what we want to do here is to make sure that the information flow along the supply chain is as good as possible so that we don't have problems like that, right? But of course, in, in, in that kind of uh, virtual class that we had, uh, you were not able to express your ideas and think of the, some possible ways of reducing uh, the, let's say, reducing this bullwhip effect. So maybe this is the time before we start our class today, before we start talking Dell's model. And I would say that Del, the, the hint here is already Dell's model is probably one of the best solutions to the bullwhip effect. Right? But before we get into Dell's model, um, and uh, just trying to, to assess your impressions of the, bull, of, of the beer game, uh, in which ways do you think that we could reduce this kind of problem in a supply chain. What could we do? Who wants to take the first guess? Or informed opinion? <laughs> it's not a guess, it's an informed opinion. Yeah? Fernando, what is your opinion? Using just-in-time production model could be uh, a way of reducing bullwhip effect. Uh, that sure, yeah. and this is why uh, this is uh, not only an interesting game for computer science people or information systems people. It is something that people in logistics and operations management uh, are dealing with. 
because yeah, one, one way of reducing this problem is working just in time. If every one of the links in that supply chain that we were simulating uh, only ordered what had been demanded, uh, although maybe uh, there would be at, at some uh, rounds of the game, they would be at a, let's say, at a loss compared to if they had speculated and done something differently. Uh, in the long run, uh, things would be better for everyone because even the manufacturer would be getting the information of what, what is the actual uh, demand that is happening there at the um, retail level, right? what, what the customers are actually uh, asking for. So I would say that uh, lean manufacturing and lean logistics were already a, an, an attempt to respond to the bullwhip effect and to some other uh, problems that you may have uh, in, in the production and, and, and logistics in general, right? And uh, of course, we, and, and lean, we usually think of lean, the lean system as a production system, but more than anything else, it's an information flow system, right? It's a system that is designed to make sure that uh, the, the supply chain will get the best information for, the, 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 for all the decisions that have to be taken along the supply chain. So this is one thing, uh, yeah, work on a lean fashion. Uh, what else? Uh, the business model uh, uh, is rebuilding in this, uh, in this uh, new, uh, new model, new, new moment. The Dell uh, did, did this. Did exactly this. It, it, the, the, maybe the rebuilding of the, the business model, or let's say the uh, it's probably the, the network the, 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 I prefer to talk, to talk about value chain and not supply chain, yeah. although they're exactly the same thing. But the supply, supply chain is a, a term that is very production related, right? But we th if we think about value chain, it seems that it, it's something that marketing people will relate to, uh, everyone will relate to, right? But what, what, uh, in this case, the, maybe one of the uh, innovations that Dell brought some 20 years ago to the manufacturing arena or to let's do the production arena was reducing the number of layers or uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the in the network right less people involved means that they but in, and basically less people involved means that they can communicate better to one another right if uh, if we have a long a very long chain that long chain means that we're going to have uh, um, uh, many situations in which information noise can be included. It was uh, successful because uh, the partners understand, understood, understood. Uh, the, the, the new business model and accept. Yeah. And new deals uh, emerge. This is, this is very important from our perspective, mainly people that are in the here in information systems, if, we, if we're more related to, to more technical, more uh, areas, we think, oh, so it's just a matter of reorganizing the systems and everything will work in a leaner way. Well, those systems are used by people uh, that, uh, and, and, and that have already adjusted themselves to working in some fashion. Uh, and changing systems is not something that will flow very naturally most of the times. Because of many reasons, uh, there are losers, uh, winners, and losers, and of course, losers are not happy about losing whatever power power position they had in the past. Uh, there are mindsets. There are people that have worked for so long doing the same thing that it's difficult for them to to think that other ways may be uh, better ways of dealing with the situation. Uh, there are arrangements uh, that, in, in fact, uh, uh, there is a a, a whole theory line in business and sociology that uh, is called, stru stru um, I will never say that in English, you know, the proper way, structuralism. It, they basically, they, they, they study the, uh, the effect of structures on whatever we do. 
Uh, we've already talked about this many times. I see even this layout that we have in a classroom is already a structure that not only allows things to happen in a certain way, but that actually dictates that they're done that way. The text uh, connects uh, the other text mm -hmm. uh, uh, that I uh, we with because the uh, information system uh, is a, 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 a variant, variant, Ver ver uh, variable, uh, variable, variable. Uh, of the business model. Yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, we, we never know who comes first. Uh, yeah. In fact, there is a lot of crashes there. You, you may have information systems that try to force and try to impose. Information systems that try to become the new structure, right? In fact, in many, in many cases, we use technology. Uh, managers, decision makers in organizations, they use technology as a way of, uh, uh, of, of imposing a new structure on the old one. But the old one is still there, you know, the, the, those bones have not been broken, all of them. Uh, 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 and of course, people that are having their bones broken are not happy about it. So the introduction of new systems, the same way as the introduction of new uh, business models, is always uh, very challenging because, uh, because of this. Uh, structures tend to impose themselves. Uh, if they're the old structures, they tend to keep their fighting and, uh, and trying to preserve their, their space. If there are new structures that are being imposed, uh, many times these new structures have a lot of enemies, all of those who were comfortable with the old structure and still do not have many allies. Uh, Nicola Machiavelli used to say that in the 1400s, right? Don't try to change because whenever you try to change something, you will get a lot of opponents but you have very little friends because uh, those who will benefit from the change that you're, you're proposing may not still understand that there is a benefit there. Right? Of course, his, uh, his um, uh, suggestion was good for the 1400s where the world changed very slowly uh, and uh, we can't take it, at least not as easily, because now uh, change happens around us and if we don't move, uh, we may be left behind. Yeah. yeah the, new, the new technology models uh, uh, change the uh, power structures. Yes. And uh, that's the, the complicated yeah. uh, on the point of view of, uh, about uh, humans. And, and we are already getting into the discussion of uh, Dell's model here because Dell found it easier to change structures because Dell's company didn't exist yet. Uh -huh. So. Uh, he was starting to build new structures. He, the, the competition had already set was, structures. Uh, a startup. It was a startup. Yeah. In fact, and this is uh, uh, the good thing about startups. Startups don't have bones yet. Right? Yeah. So they are very flexible to go, uh, go anywhere depending on where they find that it's sensible. And if they find uh, a way to go that they find sensible and the rest of the world also find sensible, they become the next big thing. Uh, of course, after they become the next big thing, they build their, 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 their bones and muscles uh, and they will be challenged again by another startup somewhere in the future with an idea that challenges what at their, when they started their business seemed to be the, the, the right and the best thing to do. All right, but anyway, let's. Uh, uh, I, I just want to before we, we, we get into our class, uh, I just want to to let me see here uh, uh, to go back a little uh, more to the, the simulation um, game. So we have these things. Uh, what Fernando uh, 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 mentioned, what Rodrigo uh, mentioned, uh, uh, we can. Uh, Think of new ways for the information for information to flow, but there, there, there definitely we need a different mindset than the mindset that was uh, around in the 80s and 90s. The, 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 the mindset that, that was around in the 80s and 90s was pretty much based on uh, uh, Porter's ideas uh, related to competitive advantage and and and. I'm not sure if you are, all of you are familiar with the five-force model. 
Do you know the five force model, Porter's five, uh, five force model? Yep. Uh, if you don't, we can easily here uh, just uh, Google it and, and I will do it five force model, Porter, and we'll just see some images of it here. Let me just get any, any of these ones here. I'll get the first one here. Uh, just want to go to the to the website where this let me see if I I just got any let's see what you see here. Yes, uh, that's the five force model here. Just try to make it a little larger. Uh, and Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, well, you know, one thing that I, have you found the five, five force model there? No. Um, one of the things that maybe, uh, Daniel, could you, I, I just noticed that I didn't turn on the, maybe turn that on because then you can see what I'm, what I see in my screen here. Uh, so, uh, uh, Porter's model, Involved uh, five main, sorry, five main uh, um, forces that, according to 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 to, to Porter, uh, go against the profitability of the organization, and he puts it in this model that I'm showing there. Um, uh, you you may you may have gotten to a, a different uh, picture, but basically. What he says is this, that those five forces are the, the competitors. He puts it at the, the center of, the, the, of the, the figure there, rivalry among existing competitors, right, right here. Uh, uh, and then he says that there are other, we should also cons uh, uh, consider that there are other forces that go against our profitability. And he includes there two forces uh, that are very important in the mindset of the, the 80s and 90s. He says, watch out for your suppliers, because your suppliers are always trying to sell their products to you at their best convenience, for the highest price, or, or maybe if, they, if they're really pressed with respect to price, for, with, with the lowest quality possible, they're, they're always trying to give you the least they can, uh, for the money that you're paying, right? And he says, and, and also keep a very uh, uh, close eye on your customers because they will try to get as much as they can from you, paying as little as possible. Uh, now, these are the, 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 these two here, the, the bargaining power of buyers and the bargaining power of suppliers. Right? He also mentions uh, the threat of new entrants and, and the threat of, substitute products. Those are not very important for our discussion right now, but thinking that your suppliers and your customers are your enemies, uh, just the same way as your competitors, uh, make you strategically take decisions that go very well in the direction of the decisions that you took in our beer game simulation. You try to optimize locally. You say, I have to make the best deals for my own business, not for the not for the value chain. Right? So we really needed uh, uh, a how do I call here? We we needed a uh, mindset change. I'm all mixed up. Let me find here. We need uh, a, a, to change the way we think the value chain uh, so that we start developing more collaborative relationships with customers and suppliers. Dell's model, when we get to it today, uh, you will see is a model based on trust, at least as a model, right? Uh, I've already had students that worked for Dell and they said, well, it's not exactly like that. Okay. The model is always more beautiful than reality. But anyway, the idea behind Dell's model was 
we have to share as much information of our business with our customers at one end so that they understand the value proposition that we are providing in our with our products and we also have to share as much information about our business as we can with our suppliers so that they are able to supply us exactly with what will provide value to our customers customers are paying for value that they perceive from all the work that has been done along the whole supply chain not only what we did in our company so we are only going to be su successful in a supply chain if our customers and suppliers are also successful this is a huge change in mind and it's not something that we just let's say that we are all in the same supply chain and we all participated in a beer game and, and now we realize it's better to it may be better to cooperate than to compete among ourselves then we get into a meeting here and say from now on we're all going to be very nice people to each other we're not going to try and exploit each other we are going to try to work together will that happen i don't know trust is not something that happens after a meeting trust is something that happens over time so again having a more technical perspective of life this group here we shouldn't think that this is a small deal no, it's just a matter of, okay from now on we understand, we understand that Dell's approach is uh, uh, better and will lead to better business so let's change what we, we did in the past you know trust is something that requires time and this is probably one of the reasons why it was so easy for and now, now I, I will already go ahead to our here to, to to the topic of our class today it's so easy for Michael Dell to talk so openly about uh, the strategy that they had thought for Dell right when you read uh, this paper and and I think it's it's still uh, well this paper it's not a paper this interview uh, that uh, he he gave um, the Harvard Business Review, Greta in the in the nineties. Uh, we see that he's telling this is the this is the paper the power the, the, the power of virtual integration and interview with uh, Dell Computers Michael Dell. We see that he tells us everything about his uh, his company's strategy. And strategizing until then was sort of something that was done between four walls, right? Only very few people knew the strategy. He was telling uh, the strategy to the whole world. And it was basically because of one thing. He was not fearing that the competition would mimic or copy his model simply because he knew that the competition, or at least the, 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 the big competition, the, the strong players in the computer market in the 90s were companies that had two uh, established structures already to, to easily move and do exactly what he was doing. So IBM, Compaq, HP, that were the other players, the, the, the serious players in that market at that time, they were all stuck with their models, with their business models that did not allow them to do what Michael Dell was proposing. Right? Uh, even people, uh, it, 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 so companies that are in a traditional uh, supply chain, uh, they find it difficult to change to a new model. Uh, when we discussed, and let me go back and see here if I if I find, when we discussed Henderson and Ben Katraman's model, when was that? Probably one of the, our first classes. Uh, oh, it's actually the, the uh, is it the Ben Katraman 94? I'm sort of a little lost here. Let me see if this is it. Uh, 
Yes. Let me just make sure that everyone sees this. So when, when we discussed this paper, IT enabled business transformation, and we saw that some companies were able to do the localized exploitation and then get into internal uh, integration. But most companies found it really difficult to go from the evolutionary levels that mainly meant doing whatever they already did in a more efficient way by using the new technologies that were available. When they had to just take this next step and start doing some revolutionary uh, use of technology, that's where, where companies got stuck. Because the revolutionary levels are all levels that require changing the structure, require changing the culture, require changing power relations in organizations. All of that make it harder. And, 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 and Dell knew that. So he, he knew that his opponents, his, the, the competition, they would be stuck here. They had done this, but, uh, you know, redesigning their processes, redesigning their networks, and even redesigning the scope of their business, all of which were necessary to compete against Dell because, that, because Dell did all of this, right? He thought of different ways of producing computers. He, he went in a lean direction. He said, I will never build a computer before my customer tells what he or she wants in that computer. After I understand the needs of a specific customer, and particularly in, a, in, a, a, in an industry where the product is already modular, he said, it's crazy that these guys get all these modules and assemble them together and make a product that is a rigid product now that they can't change unless they take it back to the factory and disassemble and assemble in a different way, right? It's crazy that they do it. Why, why do they do it like that? Why, why do they assemble everything and put there in a shelf for the, kid, the customer not to have the option to say, I, I would prefer it to be a little different. They all understood that. He designed the process. He, he redesigned the process. He redesigned the, the, the network that was involved in building that product and making that product available to the markets. Uh, in, he, and when I mean he here, I'm talking about uh, Dell as a company. Uh, and, right? uh, so so Dell, uh, Dell, the company, understood that it made no sense to send a, 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 a completely assembled computer directly to a retailer because that was most certainly not exactly what the customer wanted. So there was technology, the, the, the late 90s, there was already technology that allowed uh, Dell to build a dialogue with customers. Remember, these are all things that we've already seen in previous lessons, right? Uh, Makina, 95, right? He noticed he could first build a dialogue, understand what the customer needed, and then provided the customer with the, 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 the right product, which would be much more valuable to, to the customer, right? So uh, that's where we, we, we stand right now. Let me go back here too. And uh, what we will start doing finally is discussing uh, uh, this uh, paper. Um, yeah, and, and, and why we're still discussing the same paper 20 years later? Well, the answer is the same I've been giving you for most of the 20-year-old papers or that, that we've been reading. Most companies still don't do it. And in fact, in this case, if, uh, if, if Harvard Business Review were there to interview Michael Dell again, uh, uh, they would notice that his company has changed a lot and has even gone back somehow in, in some of these ideas. Uh, so this is something that we can also discuss uh, here. What, what are the reasons why such a beautiful model suddenly went wrong 
to a company that was so successful in perceiving that it made so much sense in the, the late 90s. Uh, but before discussing what went wrong for Dell, and, and more importantly than that, I think that this paper still shows what can go right for most other companies in most industries that have products, many of those products that are already modular in, the many, in, in its manufacturing, in their manufacturing, uh, and that could 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 be, uh, uh, or for which the process could could be rethought to make sure that customers have a saying. Customers say what they need, even if it's little details, before the product is completely fixed. Uh, and this happens in most industries. Right? Uh, operations management uh, people even have developed a, a, let's say, a process uh, to deal with that, that is, okay, we can't, we can't build products in a personalized way, in, in most cases, in some industries do that, of course, it call, it's called a project, when you do everything from the beginning, you, but in most cases, you can't uh, treat uh, each uh, product that you're selling to a customer as a project because it costs much more. If you're selling that product only once to one only one uh, customer, it, it's very costly. So you have to have very good reasons to do that. But they noticed that they could, uh, in, in many cases, the differences in what each customer needs are not that huge. Uh, so in fact, what you can do is you can build a platform of products that are essentially the same in most of the, the modules that it uses, in most of the energy that has to be put into the, the product, they're the same, but that are different in the, let's say, the periphery. Uh, car assemblers do that these days. Sometimes the same production line uh, produces several different cars, or at least several, several cars that we perceive, we as customers perceive as being completely different. But basically, that use the same lo production logic, many times the same uh, components, or many components that are the same, and then the final look, so at the end of the line, uh, is different. When the customer finally tells what they want, uh, that's, that's where difference is implemented in the problems. For operations management, this, te this technique or this model of uh, uh, trying to postpone tasks that where, where knowing what the, the customer wants is critical and trying to do at earlier stage things that are usually very, uh, the customer doesn't have much to, to say about, uh, they call it postponement. To postpone means to 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 do to do later things that you could do now. It's the opposite to the the proverb, right? We usually say, "Why should we leave to do to do something later when we can do it now?" Here we're saying exactly the opposite. I will not do now something that I may regret later. So I only do now what the customer is not going to, you know, to go about. What's the cause of this, uh, the whole, uh, get, uh, got uh, uh, to create uh, mass customization. Mass customization, yeah, mass customization uh, uh, is, a is, 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 is a concept that relates to this idea of postponement. Because mass customization means that you're still producing in large scales, you're producing, it, it could, it's still mass production, but you do it in a way that the customer at the end, when, when the product get, gets to the customer, the customer says, this was done precisely to my specifications, right? The specifications was, were about the finishing. Uh, uh, I think I've already told you, I, I, I never know who I did and who I, I told that sometimes it, it's my undergrad students, but we call that the pizza man strategy, postponement. Because the pizza man, for example, in a warm day like today, uh, pizza man around Curitiba and 
uh, are probably thinking, well, a lot of people will come to my pizza uh, place tonight. Uh, and of course, pizza in Brazil is something that we usually eat in the evenings. So they're not thinking about lunch, but they're thinking about tonight. Right? A lot of people will come here probably to have some pizza, drink some beer. Uh, so I better, as soon as I get to, to my workplace, I will start making the dough. I estimate that I will have, I don't know, 100 customers tonight. So I will already make the dough for 100 pizzas or for, for pizza for 100 people. Uh, this is a, 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 an easier estimate to estimate how many people will come because they may be 90, they may be 110, but it's easier to estimate that I will have 100 people than it is to estimate how many people will want a mozzarella pizza or a California pizza or a, I don't know, whatever, uh, margarita or, right? So I don't try to forecast the details. I do the dough and, and in, in this case, uh, pizza men are lucky because the, the part of the production of pizza that takes longer is exactly making the dough. Putting the, the ingredients, the, the, the toppings, is something that very quickly can be done, right? Uh, so you can, when you go to the customer's table and, the, the, and take the order, you go back to the kitchen and just put the, the, the toppings there and in five minutes, the pizza is ready. So why would a pizza man start making decisions on the toppings before the customers uh, have a say? This happens to, 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 to pizza production, but it also happens to airplane production or car manufacturing or whatever. There are things that are going to be the same. Even uh, Michael Dell, he knows that uh, uh, all computers he, he, he built and sold would have a microprocessor. And that everyone would like to have the best microprocessor available. Basically the latest, the most current one. Uh, so microprocessors was definitely something that Dell had to agree with its supplier in advance. Uh, make the best forecasts that uh, were possibly uh, uh, were possible to 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 to, to do, uh, and then um, and then uh, and, and those uh, processors would have to be available when the customer told the toppings, the, the, the other parts that would be uh, necessary for that for their computers, but. At least processors, memory, some of these things, customers don't have a lot to say. They may even say, "Oh, I, I want more memory." Right? Okay, but it's uh, but it's still going to be memory. So there are things that there are things that there's no way. I, if, if you if you want to buy memory, you have to negotiate with some of those manufacturers in uh, in the South uh, Pacific, uh, in, in South Asia, uh, months in advance. It's not something that, that, that you can order only after the customer uh, places an order for a computer. But there are, there are other parts that you can order more closely to, to when the, the, the customer makes uh, his or her own order. And besides, assembling them all together is something that you should only do according to Dell's model after the customer tells what he or she wants. Uh, notice that by reversing the logic of production by using principles of lean uh, production and waiting until the customer orders. So changing what used to be a push model into a pull model. Right? I'm not sure if you're familiar with these terms, but they're also used very frequently in, in, in operations management. Right? The push model is a model in which you produce whatever you, you're used to produce and push it to the next link in the supply chain. Push it out of the, 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 the factory and hope, push, push, into, push into the customers and, and, and hope that they're going to buy it. And if they don't buy it, then what you do, you do a promotion, you sell for half the price, you, you have to get rid of them. But you pushed 
to the market. That is the old model, and that's a model that doesn't bring knowledge back into the, the organization, or that brings knowledge too late in the process. You, it, it surely does bring uh, knowledge. After you, you, you push a lot of products into the market, and those products are stuck, and customers don't buy, or the retailers send it back to you, you realize that you did something wrong. But it's possibly too late. You, you've already spent a lot of money and energy into those products that may never find a customer. So with the technology that we, ha we have today, and in fact, with the technology that Michael Dell already had available 20 years ago, it was possible to, to, to change the, the logic of, the, of uh, to change the process and to, and to change how computers were made available to customers. Of course, it, it, it also required some culture change from customers. And I would say most customers would say that they prefer to buy something straight from a shop and that they, they pay and they get the, the product straight away than paying in advance and getting the products only a week or two weeks later. Right? Uh, we can't have it all. The, the, the thing here and here is, okay, what do you prefer? To have the product immediately or to have a product in some reasonable time? but having a product that fits more precisely uh, your needs, that, let's say, has more value to, to, to you, right? Uh, uh, Michael Dell noticed that uh, there were many customers that would be happy to wait some time to get precisely what they, they wanted. Uh, well, I wanted to go to, uh, to the first round of uh, impressions from you. What were the things when you, you were reading this 20-year-old paper or this 20-year-old interview, what were the things that you thought were really relevant for still for today? Continue uh, relevance. Uh, the startups uh, work uh, this way today. Mm -hmm. Search the, the, the market uh, obsessively. Yeah, there's one interesting thing about startups today, not 20 years ago. If you if you what what startups did 20 years ago was business plans. Yeah. Startups 20 years ago were still using uh, uh, IBM mentality. What startups do now is using Dell's model. They, they don't even, startups don't even have a product, right? I mean, they have an idea. But they're looking for uh, customers for that idea, and they're they're happy to change the idea to fit the market. The, the, the startups are companies that are willing to learn with the customer. They, of course, the, the, the startup leader has a dream or has a vision to start with. But if you if you read any of the more recent rec recent recommendations to, to to how to to develop. They don't even call it a business plan any longer, much to develop the, the, the product or, or even the, the, the company. Uh, in the case of a startup, they will say, uh, go and talk to customers, build the dialogue, right? Customers will tell you, you, you may have a good idea, but it may have to be fine tuned to the market. Maybe the, the idea that you have would suit you very well, but the fact is that nobody else is you, right? And you are not your customer. You, you need people that are willing to put their hands in their pockets and take money out of there and pay for it so that you survive in the market. So go talk to, to customers. So now we even have, yeah, we use this expression, lean startups. In the past, they were not lean. Now they're lean because they, they, they understand that they, they're using, to some extent, Dell's model. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the, the, the role uh, founder is the... Is uh, searching in the market uh, mm -hmm. and collect the, the information about customers. Mm -hmm. Not the uh, other contract uh, deal with other people to. So, so again, no, notice how that relates to Dell's uh, model. Uh, the, so you're saying the CEO, the guy who starts the, the, the company, he has to, he or she has to be looking eye to eye with customers, no intermediaries. Because each time you put someone in the middle, 
a middleman. Middlemen are there to, of course, middlemen are there for some reason. Uh, sometimes you, and in the past, they were even more meaningful because in the past you were so concerned into, in, in pushing products out of your company that you had no time to deal with customers. So you, 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 you had the middlemen that were the, 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 the wholesalers, the retailers, everyone who were in the distribution channel. You deal with customers. I don't want to deal with them. I don't want to know about customers. You, you deal with them and, and I will keep pushing my products through you so that you, but that's, that, that was the old mentality when the, the environment didn't change very fast. So if customers bought your product in the past, you had, you were sure that they would buy your products in the future. Nowadays, things are different. Uh, it's very important that you have much more direct channels to talk to, to end customers because uh, that makes sure that you're tuning your product to, to their needs and you're not being misled by middlemen that are there. They, they may be even uh, aligned with you, but it's still, each time you put some uh, middlemen in the middle of the, the way, you, you, you put filters that prevent the good information to flow uh, as well as you might wish. What other ideas or impressions you had when you when you read things that you said, "Gee, this guy said this guy was talking about this twenty years ago." My company still doesn't do that. Or and yeah. Sure. But if customers is very uh, how do you do this? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're, 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 yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe what you're saying is, well, there was also Steve Jobs who said the customer doesn't know what uh, he or she wants before I present it to them, right? Uh, and and that, that's probably your, your, your concern. Uh, well, although, although Steve Jobs said that, that was not what, uh, what Apple did uh, over its history. Uh, Apple was a company that always was very engaged, very well tuned with its customers. Uh, uh, we, we may attribute some of Dell's success to the vision of people like Steve Jobs, but they were always checking very soon in the, the process what was happening. In fact, uh, I think you remember in one of our previous uh, texts, when Dell, oh, sorry, when Apple very soon in, in it's, it's still pushing products into the markets, but very soon realized that customers didn't know what the mouse was for in the late uh, uh, 1980s, for example. People until then had had, you know, the closest thing to a mouse that they had in their, I don't know if this is, I'll, I'll show this here. The closest thing to this that they had had in their, Homes before that, and I'm, I'm talking here obviously about um, uh, and customers in family. If, if families buying their first computers, first the, the closest thing to a mouse they had was the pedal for the sewing machine. So what happened uh, was that people were trying to put this on the floor and, and step on it, and thinking that this was something you you had to tap with your feet, right? Uh, but Apple was there, they, 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 their uh, um, call, uh, um, call center was not a third party that they hired, as many companies do, to make sure that the customers will never be able to talk to them, right? It was right the opposite. Their call centers were very well connected to their design center and things that customers were complaining of the things that customers didn't understand were, were very quickly fanned back into the, the system. So, uh, although, you know, we sometimes think that Apple worked in a different way, in fact, Apple was so well tuned with its customers that many times it understood and knew what customers uh, would want even before customers knew it was possible. Right? This happens many times, right? Customers are not obliged to, to have a very uh, good knowledge of the 
most recent technologies and which changes uh, in, in our lives they will allow. Uh, so they're not going to be able to, to come and tell us about things that they don't know. Uh, that reminds me of uh, also another uh, survey that was performed by one of those operators. I think it was AT&T in the United States, also some 30 years ago, uh, asking people what developments they wanted to see in the telephone. And people at that stage didn't even know about the possibilities of, for example, of mobile phones. So what they said is uh, they wanted uh, the numbers to, to be lit so that they could dial a number in the dark, for example. Or they wanted larger numbers so that they could see, maybe talking to older people that have some, some vision impairment. Uh, some other customers would say that they hated that curly uh, wire that could be, I, I mean, most of you would relate to that. You know, each time you, 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 you took the phone, you sort of flipped it, and, and at the end of the day, you had to get the phone here and, and let the thing uh, unroll because it was all. Uh, and so people said, well, think of a way uh, in which I don't have to deal with that all the time because that's annoying. No customer, they, they, they had thousands of customers providing them with their expectations for development, for innovation. No customer said, I want to get my phone, put it in my pocket and go anywhere I want. Because if you don't think something is possible, you're not going to, to, you know, to require that. You only require, you only ask for things that you think that are possible, that are feasible. Uh, so, uh, in, that, in that sense, I, I, I think that even the examples that could go the other way, if we see their, what, what they say is not necessarily what they, they did. Of course, it's, 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 it's good for the marketing to say, well, you know, I, I read your minds, uh, or I, I, I read your mind in the future. You're not even thinking of that, but I know that you think about that, so I will give you the product. It's good, good for the marketing, but uh, it's not necessarily what they Okay, so yeah, Google Glass. Uh, well, Google Glass was a commercial failure up to now, at least. Uh, uh, it was so it was a company trying to push something into the market. Uh, I, I'm not very. I don't know if I if, if if I can really state what the reasons were for it to fail so far. I think that there are technical issues that probably are even larger than other concerns. Although there would or there will be a lot of concerns about this technology and any augmented reality technology, uh, I think we'll still have to debate it in many other, with many other respects than just a technical uh, issue. Uh, of course, all of us uh, in, in a first, you know, in, in, first contact with a product like that, we said, well, cool, this uh, will allow me to do lots of uh, things. But at the same time, we already have a lot of problem with things being put in front of our eyes, right? We were talking about fake news. That was fake news was probably around for, for, uh, for all times, but they are very much more impactful now because they're put in front of our eyes and they're put in front of our eyes. It's the fake news that appear in front of our eyes are those fake news that are able to make us feel stronger about beliefs that we already had or that weaken or make us uncertain about uh, ideas or concepts that we, that we had. And they are very well planned because they are, and, and they will be even better planned in the future because they're not only based on, it's not just a matter of broadcasting. It's, it's a weird, it's a dark building a dialogue, but it, it already relates to things that we find reasonable. So it helps change our, our, our mind. So 
I, I think that Google Glass has also this dark side that needs to be uh, discussed. And, and many of the, the, the new technologies that we are very enthusiastic about sometimes, they, it's good that they sometimes that they didn't mature technically as expected, because in addition to being technically feasible, there is a lot we have to mature as uh, a society. We, we're definitely losing this war right now. Right? We're not being able to, um, as humans and as good human beings, we're not being able to build the dialogues uh, in a fair way. We are, we are using technology in a way that these dialogues are many times uh, skewed, uh, they, they, they're based on some powerful people's interests, uh, they're based on ideologies, they're based on all sorts of uh, things that we would like to have filtered out of our uh, understanding of the world. But anyway, what else? Little details, things that you found. Well, this is this is just a detail, but it's so curious, so interesting. So, I want more people talking. Some, even if it's just for you know to give give us a sentence to to go on with. And let's build a dialogue, right? At the beginning of the semester, you had the the, the right to be a little shyer, but now that we're getting close to the end. The challenge uh, of uh, Michael Dell uh, is uh, not just about uh, information systems, but uh, deal with partners, collaboration uh, between uh, companies. And uh, I think that uh, there is uh, there are uh, there is a, a effort, a considerable effort. More, more attention to the business, more uh, energy uh, of the founder and the other people uh, to support the, uh, his ideas. It's not he, he didn't even uh, he didn't have to be just a, a well. In fact, Dell didn't bring any technology to this, right? Dell was a guy that was around. And he saw well, computers are sold in a weird way. There's technology that could allow it to, to be sold in a different way. Nobody's doing it. I don't understand why, or maybe he was clever enough to, I understand why if they're stuck to their models, but I can do something different, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, we, 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 we have uh, there uh, that kind of situation in which he was able to do it differently because he was starting up, right? It was a startup. So, People that went to there, there to work for Dell were people that believed in this new concept. And it, it was not difficult to believe in it, right? Because it made sense. It would make sense even to IBM. It's just that IBM couldn't change. So it was easy to, to, to bring in people that believed in the, in the new model, but he also needed to be a very strong communicator of it because people had to understand the model and had to understand uh, in which ways this model was better than the previous ones for that particular business. Right? And in fact, I would say that even this interview, you know, to a, to a journal is already part of this strategy that Michael Dell developed of how to communicate his ideas or the ideas of his company to many different stakeholders, to customers, first of all. Customers who read or who read this paper or read this interview would say, yes, in fact, why do I buy a computer that is already in inventory, that someone decided what I wanted or what I needed before I, 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 I said anything about it? It doesn't make sense. So he was using this interview as well as any other uh, ways he had available you know, the website or whatever, any possible to communicate with customers and show, look, you were exposed to a different model in the past, but I have something here that I hope 
you will also find that makes more sense. Uh, he was also talking to suppliers and to, to, and, and to customers, even if they're, they're, in their case, the customers are the, the, the end customers. But he was talking to suppliers and trying to show here um, his principles, the, the principles of an organization that wants to cooperate and not to compete with its suppliers. Of course, again, this is a model. Uh, models, uh, models try to 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 force or uh, to, to 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 take you to some sort of reality, but in reality, things are never exactly like the model. But the model here is. Uh, we want to build trust relationships with our suppliers. It's an interesting kind of uh, trust relationship, though, because he says very clearly here in the, in the interview that he wants to have the best suppliers in the market. And he will trust and he will work very closely with the suppliers his company has to make sure that they keep being the best. Begin the uh, short company, and in, uh, in the, at the moment that uh, he get he got to to connect to IBM and the other uh, companies. Yes, but but notice that uh, uh, you remember you think about the, the horse uh, horse uh, races. He says I prefer to sit there in the audience and see the the, the horses race and pick the winners at the end of the race, then, uh, uh, and, and, and what he's meaning here is, I prefer not to develop the technology myself, because if I have all these research and development departments developing yeah. new technology, whatever they develop, they will push to the company. We will, be, we will have to use the technology that they develop regardless of being the best. And then we'll have to push and convince our customers that that's the best technology. So instead of doing that, he says, I, I don't build, the, I, I don't design the, the technologies. I will be very uh, close to my customers to know what technologies they want. And, and then I will look very closely at the market and see who has that technology that better suits the needs of my customers. Uh, and I will, but, but I'll, I'll keep a close relationship with these suppliers while and still while they're, they're the best. I will make sure that I put all my efforts into them keeping being the best. But if they're not, if and when they're not the best any longer, I would say it was very good uh, working with you, but our relationship is over. So notice, it's, it's, it's a weird sense of, uh, of commitment. It's a commi commitment. Let's work together and let's work very closely together while uh, you and uh, while we are a, a, a a good, uh, well, we're good partners. If we at any stage notice that it doesn't make sense, we'll just say goodbye, right? Uh, Vinicius de Moraes, this uh, Brazilian poet, uh, had a saying that was uh, that, that love be eternal while it lasts, something like that, right? Love, I, 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 I will Basically, what I'll do, I'll, I'll put all my efforts into a relationship, into a love relationship, uh, while it lasts. Uh, and I would claim that by doing that, by putting your all your efforts into making a, rela a relationship prosper, will make it last longer than if you're competing with your with your partners, right? So. Uh, my wife never thinks that this is very romantic when I make this kind of an analogy. But I said, I, I keep telling her, you know, love to be, to, to, to last forever has to be um, developed every day. If you, if you stop it, and so you have to commit to it for it to last. And then it will last. Or at least it has a much uh, larger probability of lasting. So let's say that uh, what Dell is proposing here to its partners is a love uh, relationship. And a, a love relationship that is very different to what we, our society has come to more recently when we, people say, well, 
For example, let's get married and see how it goes. That's the recipe for failure, for sure, right? Because there's no commitment, or the commitment is only while everything is working really fine. Dell's idea here is we work really hard to make sure that, considering that you are my, that I bet on you, that you are my best bet, we'll work really hard for you to keep being uh, the best in the market. But it's a market thing, right? So you don't mess up, right? Keep being uh, strong. Uh, what else? Rodrigo, give the others a chance. You've been talking too much. I want to, to hear something from Marcel, the other Rodrigo, Gabriel. Anything that you read there that you thought was interesting for whatever reason? Eliminating the, the distribution channel, but what, what does he say? Yeah, if there is already a distribution channel that is established, there is going to be resistance, uh, for sure. And this is why, again, this is a, a, one of the reasons why Michael Dell is so confident that he can talk so openly about Dell's strategy. Because he looks at the competition, or he looked at the competition he had. We're talking here about what was happening in, in, in the 1990s, late 1990s. Uh, he looked at them and said, yes, they can't get rid of, of their distribution channels because there is going to be a lot of resistance. And what is the resistance there? Think that IBM sells 100 computers a day, a minute, a second, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. But in, anyway, they sell 100 computers and 99 of those computers are sold through their traditional partners because that's the way they always did and they're trying to, 1998, 1999, they're trying to sell computers through the web. And they sell one computer there for each 99 computers that the traditional sellers sell. And then uh, the sellers get together and say, look, IBM, we are not enjoying these experiments that you're doing. We, 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 don't, we, we don't think that it's for it's good for our relationship if you keep trying to sell computers through the web. Because, of course, if you're selling directly, we lose our, our business here. And we are together on that, right? So, uh, if you want to sell on the web, you have to make sure that uh, the conditions that are, or whatever, you, 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 basically you have to sell them more expensive than we sell in our shops. And then, of course, IBM would never be able to, to have an interesting proposition for the web because, again, when we, we, if we have an option of buying directly on a shop or buying on the internet, the internet is more expensive and as inflexible as the other, we'll choose the, 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 the traditional way. So you're right. Yeah, uh, uh, the channels that you already have will fight back against any change. And this is why it's difficult to see change, or it's, it's much more challenging uh, to see change in companies that have already been around and already have a way of doing their business. What else? I was reading, I was... I was remembering the beer game that I suppose there is you can beat from the customer there with the beer because you have less chance to have noise inside. Yeah. The yeah. closest you are to the to the to the end customer, the the, the better you understand the market. And also uh, similar to the paper talk about the that if you have uh, closer uh, channels to the customer, you can have this uh, answer from the customer 
So notice, although I brought this paper thinking of how Bell deals with the upstream side of the value chain, uh, it clearly matches all what we had already discussed with respect to downstream side. So Dell builds, when we talk about the, the, the direct model, Dell's direct model, some people only think of the, the customer side. Dell sells directly to the end customer because it allows it to better understand the market. And that's surely, uh, probably what's more visible. Uh, but uh, we also have things going the other way. Dell deals with not many suppliers. In fact, uh, I think in the interview it shows that uh, the company prefers to have fewer suppliers that are for which Dell's business is more important. They don't want to, to start a competition of, among several possible suppliers. Notice the, the traditional way of thinking, when we think Michael Dell's strategic, uh, the, the five forces, the five forces almost, uh, although Mike, uh, Michael Porter, I don't think that he, he ever claimed that, he, he said, well, you have to plan thinking about your, 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 your customers and, and your suppliers. But when you think of your suppliers using Por uh, Porter's model, you think I will never have just one supplier. I need to have as many suppliers as I can because then when one supplier tries to impose a higher price, I will tell, look, I have many other alternatives. So whenever you go with that kind of discourse to your suppliers, I have a lot of other alternatives. It means that you're not emphasizing the partnership. You're actually trying to, to have a, an optim, uh, to optimize locally. You want to get the best you can from the deal so we are going to, it's the kind of relationship in which the sum is zero for you to, you know, the traditional way, for you to win or to get a little more, someone will have to get a little less. Uh, the Dell Modus principle is that maybe if we work together, we will have a win-win situation in which everyone is going to be able to get a little more. But of course, that re requires trust, right? Trust that the sharing is going to be fair and not that uh, Dell is going to keep all the revenue for itself or for being the strongest link. In many cases, uh, as Rodrigo was saying, it's, uh, it's impressive that uh, Dell was not the strong link, uh, the strongest link, because Dell was dealing with some of Dell's suppliers in the, the 90s, although they were component builders, they were very strong uh, component uh, builders. We're talking, for example, one of the companies that uh, Dell deals here, and it is a very strong partner, was Sony. Right? Uh, but he made, uh, uh, Dell made the, the, the monitors uh, business be so interesting for Sony that Sony was a very important partner for, for Dell in developing it, uh, Dell's own business. Okay, well, uh, of course, there's a lot more uh, uh, on this paper. Uh, we, we didn't get to, as I, as I said, Dell's model didn't, you know, as, as time went by, Dell's model was not as good for Dell any longer. Things happen in the middle of the way, uh, and uh, Dell was trapped by its own success history, as it happens to most companies. Uh, you'll probably see that uh, he claims it's part of their strategy. We don't want to sell the first computer to anybody. Uh, in, the in the 90s, that uh, already made sense because their main business was in the United States or uh, let's say more mature markets. And they said, I prefer, if you're going to buy your first computer, buy it from, from the competition, please. You're going to have it past a, a horrible experience. You don't know what you're buying. So you, you will buy the wrong computer, but you will learn with it. And then uh, the when you want to buy the second computer, you buy from me. That's the message. And besides, it was 
impossible for someone to buy it from Dell directly because uh, if they didn't have a computer, because the way Dell dealt with customers was through the web already. So you, you had to have a connection to the internet. Uh, of course, uh, before the internet, he already had the zero eight hundred, so you could also buy through phone lines. Uh, but it was basically buying from Dell if you, if, you, if you didn't have any computer literacy was difficult because what made Dell's computers a good value proposition was exactly the fact that you, you, you could say, well, but I, I would like to have a computer with more memory. Uh, I, I need a, har a larger hard disk. I need, a, 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 I don't know, a larger screen or a smaller screen. Uh, each person has their own uh, needs, right? I remember that at, at one stage, computers were, or, or maybe notebooks were getting each time smaller. And but I, for example, always prefer the the 50, at least 15 inch screens, uh, preferably 17 inches, because my notebook was also the computer that I used at home. So I, for me, it was. But uh, you know, for you to have these preferences, for you to have your your opinions, you have to have already experience with the, the product. So Dell said, I'm selling computers to people who are buying their second, third computer. I'm not selling to someone who's buying the first computer. Please buy from IBM or buy from HP or whatever. That was the message. I, I, I don't know if you've got that, that impression, but uh, this is an impression that, that one gets from reading uh, this interview. And then what happened in 2005? Nobody knows what happened in 2005, but everyone knows what happened in 2007 and 2008 in the major markets in the world. What happened in 2008 in the world? Mainly in the... In the huh? The crisis, huge crisis. In the United States, it was the American families, the North American families weren't being able to pay their mortgage for their homes. That was 2007, 2008. There was something else that was happening in 2005 that was not in the news. But now, so many years later, it's easy for us to, to understand. People were in the United States were stopping to buy new computers. Dell lost the leadership in the market. If you if you, if you find on the web uh, any charts that show uh, market shares, you see that in 2005 Dell started losing. Uh, it's I mean until then it was the the, the best the, the company that, that had the market, the largest market share. But it started lagging behind, and started lagging behind exactly those companies that first were there were, were losers. I, uh, IBM, except that IBM was not IBM any longer. IBM was uh, a Chinese company. What's their name? Uh, Lenovo. Lenovo. Uh, <laughs> HP and Compaq had merged. The two of them were going bankrupt, so they decided to join forces, and so. HP was around, and we, 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 the name Compaq disappeared, but uh, HP was around. HP became the leader in the, the, the PC markets in the world in 2005. If we had used the PC market as a way of predicting the world's economical crisis, it would have been very easy to know that Two years, two years later, the, the, the North Americans would stop paying the mortgage for their homes. Uh, before you stop, you, you stop, you stop uh, paying for your home, you cut other costs, right? Those that are not so absolutely necessary for your life. So when they, they stopped buying new computers, that was a red flag, should have been a red flag to already say, well, there's something happening to the market. Uh, well, for, for Michael Dell, it was a disaster because uh, Dell's traditional customers, 
that were those that had already bought computers before, the North Americans, the Europeans, were not buying computers any longer, and computers were being sold in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, those, South Africa. Uh, those were the countries that were buying computers, but they were not buying from Dell because people in those countries were buying, here in Brazil, they were buying at Casas Bahia. Uh, they were buying their first computer. If they were buying their first computer, how would they buy it from Dell? So notice, Dell was trapped, he was tricked by his own success in history. He said, his idea was, we don't sell computers to first time users, but at some stage, the traditional market disappeared and only first time users were around to be sold to. So Lenovo probably had a lot of fun selling to the Chinese and to, and, and to part of the world uh, because there was no competition from Dell. Uh, in Brazil, Positivo was very happy and developed a whole business because of the lack of competition. In fact, it was not, again, it was not that Positivo saw a great market. Customers here were saying, we want to buy computers. We finally have uh, money in our pockets. It was the beginning of uh, Lula's government, right? The first one, not the, the, the chaotic, uh, chaotic uh, times that came afterwards. But people felt that they had money in their pockets. They, they had been dreaming with a computer at home for 10 years. They wanted to buy it and there was no one to sell it. I remember at that stage, I was uh, a professor there at uh, Universidade Positivo, and I once was invited, because I taught strategy and things like that, I was invited to this uh, meeting in which they were uh, discussing uh, how they would go from manufacturing or assembling 400 computers, of, sorry, 4,000 computers a month to assembling 120,000 because they were just uh, having this uh, partnership with Casas Bahia. Uh, and if that partnership happened, that would be what would happen, right? From 4,000 to 120,000 computers a month, just like that. And I remember that uh, I didn't say much at the meeting because it was all, but one thing that I said uh, was that I thought that maybe if it would be such an, an extreme um, jump from 4,000 to 120,000 computers a month, I thought that maybe they should brand it differently, that they should not use the name Positivo, that was a name that already, it was a, a good brand for for the, the, the industries in which it, it, it was, I mean, Positivo had a, a good name in education, had a good name in in printing and, and some of the other industries they, that they were involved. And I thought that there was a risk that maybe uh, they would have problems there. It would be profitable, but I thought maybe they would have problems with uh, providing the market with support, assistance, uh, all, all the logistics, everything would be clumsy, I thought. And, and I mean, I was... Uh, there are things that you, you, you know and then you fear, right? Uh, so I was fearful. Uh, and, uh, and then I heard uh, some time later that uh, a comment that was made after I left was that we'll do exactly the opposite. But we'll put Positivo's name because if we don't put that name, then it's not going to work. If we put that name, we will have to make it work. But I have to agree that they were somehow successful. Of course, I don't think that anybody thinks that the, the, the brand Positivo is the best computer brand that uh, one can get. But I think the market understood that it was what was available at that uh, moment. And I think that it also didn't... Most people don't even know that Positivo computer, except for people in, in this city here, right? But uh, if you go around in Brazil, most people don't relate Positivo computers with Positivo University or Positivo educational systems or whatever. So maybe they were right. Uh, although they did have all the problems that I expected that they would, 
because it's it's obvious that you you don't build all the resources that you need uh, in such a small uh, amount of time. Um, okay, so I guess uh, uh, this is more than enough for, for us to start with. Uh, maybe we have a little break now, and then when we come back, we get to our uh, Moodle forum and start discussing this uh, this interview in a little more detail. Okay, so 15 minutes. Yeah.